Now, if we test it, I'll just tell you something. If we test it, leaving it in the bag, we can't get alpha radiation. Alpha radiation can't get through that much plastic, but it can pick up beta and gamma. So let's try it. So we bring it, you know, typically with these things, you gotta, if it's a weak source, which is my guess is this is, we need to repeat and listen uh, a few times. It's not gonna be instantaneously clear. So we listen to the tick rate or look at the red dot. Now I take this away, we continue to listen. Well, that seems, I'll put it back. Is there, does there seem to be a difference? I think there is, I think there is. I mean, you know, the longer you count, the better the statistics get and the more you can convince yourself. Um, so it is gently, detectably radioactive. Don't. <laughs> you know, the changes in public attitudes towards this stuff has changed so much. I have, a, not a lot, but a few pieces of jewelry usually sold in Moab, Utah, where they didn't use trinitite, but they used uranium ore. And they would put, very, uranium ore comes in various colors, and it's, it's, well, it's very pretty. Oh, you already saw some, some jewelry? Yeah. yeah, okay, okay, okay. Um, and there's also jewelry, which is radioactive, people don't know it. There's, there are some semi-precious stones. One of them is econite, uh, which we haven't heard about very much, but it's glass, it's, it's clear uh, green. And people cut it, traditionally have cut it into gems, um, and it's got a lot of thorium in it, which happens to be radioactive. Uh, I don't think it's dangerously so, but. Have you used jet to wear? That's what I'm curious about. Have you used something like jet to wear places that are now radioactive? You know, I'm inventorying my collection. I may someday <laughs> donate my collection to a museum, and I've got a huge collection. The radioactive red, the yeah, Esther color, I have over 300 pieces of Fiesta of that color, why in the hell did I buy? <laughs> you know, I'd go into an antique store and I'd see this stack of Fiesta Ware plates and they were only charging at some of the antique stores I went to back then, $4 a plate for little saucers or something. I thought, oh God, I'm, I'm a miser. I don't know, I, I, uh, but at any rate, I have hundreds <laughs> of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, a number of my students, uh, I'm, I've got a lot of Geiger counters, and my students take them home, and, and always in every class there's some family that has some of that, that stuff. It's, it's, it still can be used with safety, I'll tell you how. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do that. Without, Yeah, I don't either remember in my head. And I didn't bring along a physics book or a unit conversion thing. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and we can figure it out, but, or we can look it up. I can remember in one of my classes where the thing that got me was a miser, and it cost a bunch of electron plates coming off, and they're like, how are we ended it? And I couldn't get it to go back and figure out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we were in class in school. Right, right. No, and I, I don't have that. That's right. I don't have that in my head. <coughs> Um, yeah, I thought I, I would uh, try to demonstrate a, a, a criticality uh, experiment here. Los Alamos and other places did lots of experiments on these geometries of, you know, when you start bringing things together, the reactivity increases. And you probably, did you see in some of the movies about some of the accidents they've had? I guess not. Um, there, there are a couple of people at Los Alamos who died because of things that happened when they were intentionally getting, and they died from, not from, there weren't any, ever any explosions from these things, but the radiation dose gets so big so fast that if you're making, if you're starting to assemble these subcritical masses, it, it can be really dangerous. I, guys, I'm gonna do this. I, I'm gonna, I was gonna, I'll tell you what I was gonna do, and I do this with my kids all the time. Uh, these are pretty radioactive, and I was gonna gradually bring them close together, and, and, and my main objective with my students is to get them to doubt everything, including what their science teacher says, and the textbooks. So I'm always doing things with a straight face. Um, I tell them I got nuclear fuel and I burn it and I show how it's radioactive and I do that by burning magnesium ribbon and I put it on a Fiesta Ware plate and I say, look, look, it's radioactive. And then <laughs> some of them catch on to that and so I say, oh, you're right, I did that because it was such high temperature, I didn't want it. But you're right, you're right. So I pull out a piece of cast iron you know, and I dust it off onto there and then we test it and it's still radioactive. 
maybe the cast iron plate's radioactive. And I tell them about the Los Alamos rebar and other stuff. There was some history of cast iron. But so I take it off of that, and I dump it right onto the table, uh, and, and I, we do it again, it's still radioactive. And I've planted uh, gamma sources uh, in association with all of these things. I tape them to the bottom of the cast iron, I tape them underneath the desk, so that every time we go to the next stage, it's still radioactive. And they remember that. Some of them go home and tell their parents that, uh, you know, Jay did a little nuclear reaction class, and I did get in trouble once with parents. In fact, I was handing around these things, and a parent wrote an eight-page, single-spaced type, unsigned letter to the school, absolutely crucifying me, saying I should be fired, et cetera, et cetera, because I had let the kids, and I passed around a piece of plutonium. Well, plutonium is a lot more dangerous than depleted uranium. Uh, it's illegal. This is legal. And it's just the story just got twisted. And the kids are very capable of it unintentionally, not telling the story quite right at home. So I've become more careful. You guys are nodding your heads about, now, guys, when you go home tonight, don't tell your parents that Jay set off a nuclear reaction and sent the radioactive waste over to the middle school, which is what I tell them when I'm doing it through a hood and whatever. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Okay, so we have to assemble these things quickly. So let's, uh, oh no, I, we were talking about the neutrons. Um, you, the, the other source of neutrons, which was a bigger concern for the engineers at Los Alamos, was that these materials, uranium-235 and plutonium-239, will spontaneously fission without a neutron coming in and tickle them. And when that happens, you get three neutrons, two or three neutrons right away. And so you have to be a little careful about how big you make these things um, because there always will be some neutrons flying around because of the spontaneous fission. Now, the, the, the half-life for spontaneous fission is very, very, very low. Uh, for uranium-235 in particular, it wasn't too much of a problem. Uh, there were some other isotopes of plutonium where it was a major problem and it affected some of what they did. But that's another source of neutrons which you have to be careful about when you're designing these things. So the game is that when you assemble these pieces, you need to have a neutron source there which will ideally suddenly turn on, because you don't want the neutrons flying around. You, want to, you actually want to have a huge number of neutrons present when you just bring together the subcritical masses, because you don't want to start with generation one and get one fission, and then 10 to the minus eight seconds later, I've got two, then yeah. Why not start in generation 10 or 20 if you can? And if you can just spray the fuel with neutrons and effectively start with generation 20, you're way, way, way ahead. And if you want to make a big bang, that's the right thing to do. So they just don't want a few neutrons. They want a whole bunch of neutrons. And there are various ways of doing it. The, the way that they used back um, then was to take an alpha source, something like this happens to be americium-241. It's the isotope that's in there. But something that sprays out alpha radiation and then put it right next to, I'm gonna leave this in the bag, but this kind of metal, this is beryllium. And I think beryllium is a pretty rare thing to, to have. Guess where I got beryllium? The black hole, which we didn't finish talking about. Well, yeah, black hole. Um, he sold this to me, and he swears it's beryllium. I haven't done any independent test. But there are some light uh, elements like beryllium and lithium, where if you spray, hit the nucleus with alpha radiation coming from this, it'll stick and join and make a bigger nucleus, but a neutron will pop out when you do that. And so what they did in those early bombs was to have beryllium or something like that and an alpha source, polonium or something, close with a little bit of a foil in between. Um, remember that alpha particles don't even get through, well, I didn't say it, but a sheet of paper or a piece of ceramic or whatever. So they had them really close together, but somehow, somehow they have a way so that when the main masses are assembled, the foil is gone or the two pieces get close together. This and this get close together, so we get a burst of neutrons. Modern weapons use little tiny proton accelerators to hit things to get neutrons. It's a whole different thing here, but you want a whole bunch of neutrons. So you have to have an initiator. And um, let me show you the, the two. And, and let's